Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today, we're going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. Today, we're going to be looking at Robert Henry and this portrait of Mildred Clark von Kleinbusch from 1914. And Robert Henry is probably an artist most people haven't heard of. Even a lot of artists haven't heard of, but Robert Henry is definitely one of the most important and certainly most influential artists in American history. And we'll take a look at some of the artists that he influenced and the influence that he continues to have throughout American art. Many people would consider him to be really the, the, the first American artist to, to really try to create a distinctly American art as opposed to uh, the academic tradition from Europe uh, that, that was prevalent at the time and many Americans were just trying to replicate what Europeans were, were doing. Robert Henry wanted to create an art that was distinctly American and that's what makes him so important. Okay, so Let's just look at the plan for today's episode. What we're gonna do is we're gonna get the image onto the canvas and there's a template that I've provided. I'll show you where to get that and how to get it onto the canvas here in just a few moments. We'll stain the canvas with a little bit of color. Then we'll talk about Robert Henry's biography and I'm telling you, it's a great story. It is worthy of a movie, especially his youth. Then we'll uh, do a, maybe a little bit of underpainting, work on the background for a short period of time, and then spend most of our time in the foreground. And we should be done in about two and a half hours, I think. Uh, I always say two and a half hours. Sometimes it's usually a little bit longer than that. But the way that Robert Henry painted, we sort of want to be going relatively quickly. His, his technique is a lot like Edouard Manet, there's a, there's a lot of kind of brushwork that is done in a speedy manner. So we'll try to get that to happen uh, as well. So if you're watching for the very first time, consider liking, subscribing, hitting the notification bell, let your friends know, take a photograph of your artwork, join our Facebook group. The link is in the description below. Upload it to the Facebook group so we can share and celebrate your art. Once a month, I go through everything on the Facebook group and give people free feedback and help people get to be a better artist. That's the goal, right? Uh, if you also want to make a donation, there's PayPal link, the YouTube super chat. You can contact me through the, the Facebook group or my email, which is on my website. All those links are down in the description below. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna get this image onto the canvas. And I just realized I don't have this queued up. So let's do just that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play this uh, video here, which is going to show kind of the process used. You'll see that I'm using a 9 by 12 sized canvas board. I've ordered these from Amazon. They're, they come out to about $2 a canvas as opposed to the $1 version you get at the dollar store. And I think they're more than twice as good in terms of quality. They hold paint a little bit better. I've printed off the outline from the Dropbox folder. I'll show you that in a moment and just printed it on my inkjet printer at home. Nothing special that you don't need any special material. And this, you know, it's eight and a half by 11. So it's not quite the, the right size to fit on the canvas, but that's perfect because it gives us a little room to put that tape there. And I put it a little bit down. So there's a little bit more room at the top of her head there. And I'm using some carbon transfer paper, which you can use. There's a link in the description below to buy it, but you can also get it at uh, any art supply, craft store, and fabric stores because people use carbon paper to transfer patterns onto fabric to, to make clothes. 
So make sure the shiny side is down, and then once that's down, then we're going to trace over most of the lines. You'll see in her hair, I do maybe half or a third of the lines there. We don't need to see this whole thing. It's pretty straightforward. Let's just zip around. I even did his signature here. And then I like just to kind of flip up and down to see, is there anything missing? Maybe that eye needs a little bit of extra work. And I guess I did a little bit of extra work here in the background. And there we go. Once it's all done, you can just peel the, the piece of paper off. I like to preserve these things so that I can use them in the future or just have it kind of handy sitting a little bit uh, out of the way here. Okay. So, uh, as promised here, I just want to show you where you can find uh, the Dropbox. So, if you click in the, the link down below, you'll see a link to a Dropbox folder. And in that Dropbox folder, if we scroll all the way down, the very ones at the very top are our most basic introductory episodes. And we are 131 here. You'll see that there is the original painting and then the outlines I did, a JPEG and PDF version, whatever's easier for you to print off at home. So, and then of course, here's the, our private Facebook group, which I strongly encourage you to join. Okay, so let's go to the next technique. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna stain the canvas with a little bit of color. This is a very uh, traditional approach to painting that I'm sure Robert Henry would have done. He would have known about this. Robert Henry was also, we'll get into his biography in a moment, but really one of the most famous art teachers in art history. And I'm sure he would have use this technique he would have known about this technique he would have taught other people how to use this technique and, and despite how kind of avant-garde he was at times he still would have valued this as an essential aspect of the artistic process so what i've just done here is i've put my warm yellow onto the canvas now you're if you're wondering what uh, warm yellow what does that mean this is the actual yellow that i'm using this Amsterdam paint. I'm not sponsored, paid by them. I bought all these materials on my own. Um, I like this because it's a relatively inexpensive paint and it does a really great job. We've done over 230 or so paintings using it. So this is what I'm using, the Azo Yellow Deep. You can use, uh, if you don't wanna use Amsterdam or you don't have this brand of paint, there's lots of other brands that are out there and these are my suggestions so you can replicate the results that I'm getting in these paintings. Here's golden. This is a much higher quality paint, but it's about four times the price. Liquitex, this is their student grade. They also make a more expensive grade. Windsor and Newton also works great. Artist Loft from Michael's Art Supply Chain. Buzz, Peebo, Holbein, Dyler Rowney. All of those paints will work just fine for these processes. And you can see there's also two yellows, two blues, two reds, and a, a white and a black. I hardly ever use black because I'm going to mix my black here. I'll show you how to do that, uh, which is kind of remarkable how you can do that with just red and blue and yellow. You can make a black. Um, but uh, this is called a split primary palette. So we'll show you how all that's done in due course here. Okay, so I've got my warm yellow on here. Maybe about twice as much paint as I put on my toothpaste or to twice as much paint here uh, it, the analogy is, it, it's like twice as much toothpaste as I put on my toothbrush. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I, I say the same thing over and over and over again, and sometimes, uh, my brain is two steps ahead of my mouth. Okay, so I'm going to stir that up real good. Again, this is the only time I ever use water when I'm painting with acrylic. Um, and I, I encourage every artist to try to get to this point. Um, you know, when you're first starting out, a lot of people do use water in their acrylic paint because I think a lot of people originally learn how to paint with water colors. And so they, they sort of just assume they're the same sort of process, um, but they are very different materials, right? 
Now, Robert Henry, I'm sure, would not have used a color this saturated. He would have used a rusty red, brownish color, which as we'll see here, brown is a color that features a lot in his work. Um, and, uh, but I'm, I've been using this warm yellow for over 230 paintings. It works really well. It's nice and fast. You just squeeze it right out of the tube and start painting. You don't have to mix any colors. And as I've shown over and over and over again, um, sometimes by painting the same painting side by side, when it's done, most people would not be able to tell the, any difference whatsoever. Uh, there is a difference, but can you taste the difference? Can you see the difference? Probably not. All right, so... That's why I think especially if you're a beginner painter, this is just a nice, simple way to get the painting started. Okay, so I just wipe off that excess paint on my brush, and then I can clean it off. And even though this water is now turning yellow, there's very little pigment in it. That's a question people ask me all the time. How come you, ne you never clean your water when you do these paintings? And sometimes you're painting for four or five hours, I'm always changing my my water every 10 minutes. It's because often people just put their brush full of paint into the water. And of course it's going to get really dirty. If we wipe most of the paint off and we're just kind of rubbing off, cleaning the little bit that's left, you're going to have lots of clean water for the entire painting process. Okay, so I'm just going to blow dry this here. So to speed up this drawing time, so when we're done talking about Robert Henry's work, we'll be ready to paint. Okay, still a little bit wet in the at the edges, but that's to be expected, right? Okay. So now that we've got some color and we've got our drawing in place, let's take a moment here to talk a little bit about who Robert Henry was and uh, and why he's so popular in the artist that he influenced. Okay, so Robert Henry was born in 1865 and dies in 1929, age 64, which again is always kind of on a little bit of the young side for a lot of artists. Um, and we'll talk, he, he sort of, again, died a little bit by surprise, especially to his friends of natural causes, but still um, kind of maybe a bit too young. So. Um, the other thing too, right off the bat, is that Robert Henry, if, you, if you're like, that's a strange name, well, it's a name that him and his family invented because his father was one heck of a character. <laughs> so originally, Robert Henry is born Robert Henry Kozad uh, and in Cincinnati, Ohio, and his father was a basically a con artist. He was a gambler and a con artist, a very strange person. And uh, there there was lots of drama growing up. And the first, you know, as I was 
you know, reading about his biography, one of the things that I was thinking about is it's it reminds me of this movie Nightmare Alley that just came out a few years ago. Uh, Guillermo, Guillermo del Toro, uh, this kind of noir thriller of this guy who's sort of on the run and uh, joins the circus and incredible film. I was I did not expect it to be as good as it was. Really highly recommended. But it this the story of his father and the various schemes that he had growing up uh, while while Ro young Robert was growing up was is is pretty shocking. So essentially, you know, um, Robert Henry is born in Ohio in Cincinnati, Ohio, and shortly thereafter, the family moves to sort of the middle of nowhere and forms a town. They form their own town um, called Coz. I think it's Cozidville or Co Cozidale. <laughs> Names the town after himself, Cozidale, Ohio. And then shortly, a few years later, moves again to Nebraska, which you know back in the day is that's a bit of a journey, right? You, you get it just you might be on a train or a wagon train and going out from Ohio to Nebraska in the late 1800s. There's infrastructure. It's not like it's completely um, uh, virgin territory where no one's there. There are people there, but you know you're you are striking out west where there it's uh um you know it, it would have been a sparsely populated area and so here's where they go they go to this town or, or to really the, again in the middle of nowhere and his father founds this town again another one named after himself Kozad, nebraska and of course, this is also where now the Robert Henry Museum is located. And uh, did I not have a? I'm I, I had some. Did, you know, even just research into Kozad itself. Eventually, the um, while they're in Kozad, the the father gets in a dispute with a local rancher, and there is. It kind of goes back and forth until Kozad tries to chase him away and it shoots his gun. And eventually there's a Pearson, the, this other fellow, the rancher, is shot and dies afterwards. And just obviously brings the attention of the police and the local citizens. I mean, I was probably not even a local sheriff. There might be a state police that, is, that has to be called in from out of the out of town out of the area and so it causes the scandal the, the 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 founding father of the town shoots someone so the this guy the father takes off kind of in the middle of the night to go escape um, in fear of getting arrested and thrown in jail and shortly thereafter the family also leaves the town they found it <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they they again start they just start moving all over the place. They uh, eventually settle. They I mean they go to New York City, then Atlantic City, and um, so I think those early episodes of and I should also say the family also changes their name. The father changes his name. I can't remember is it listed in here? Uh, Robert Earl Henry. Or no, the, sorry, the father changed the name to Richard Henry Lee. And the Robert Henry Kozad, the, the son, the, 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 the subject of today's episode, changes his name to Robert Earl Henry. So instead of Henry, changes the name to Henry. It's, it's interesting that, that he would choose a name that is relatively similar to his original name, as opposed to something completely different uh i i mean i you almost wonder if it was done deliberately to throw off authorities because maybe people would say well you should change it to something completely different that way they'll never find you versus something kind of similar that people oh no it's just a confusion there that I, I can understand why you'd think we're related because the names are kind of similar but no we, I, i've never heard of the Kozak, Kozak, that's interesting, what is that, right, so 
who knows? But I, I, I just imagine that that kind of early uh, foundational experiences of this uh, swindler, gambler, father uh, would have had on the the young Robert Henry. And I, I kind of wonder if that might have been one of the reasons why he later became like this father figure to so many other artists and became a teacher almost as if to sort of correct uh, his own family history, to sort of redeem himself and not really the family name because it had been long changed, but to to kind of make a, a historical break between him and his father. If his father was going to be this outrageous character who is always on the run from the law and from citizens of the towns that he himself founded, then Robert Henry was going to do the opposite. He was going to be a, like a super upstanding, responsible guy that was going to kind of have this uh, literally, well, not... Well, he, I mean, he became a teacher, but have his own kind of school of students, both in like the, the, the institutional school sense, but also in the sense of like um, a collective spirit of like a family, like a, a group of people that he could depend on, that would support him, that would look up to him, uh, respect him, because he probably didn't feel that he really respected his own father anyway just doing a little psychoanalyzing here so uh, uh, he he studies at the pennsylvania academy of arts in philadelphia which is a noted institution especially at the time and one of his teachers is the protege of thomas eakins and thomas eakins is an is an american artist that was really one of the first big name american artists and Eventually, I want to do an episode on Thomas Eakins because he is really, really important. The one thing with Thomas Eakins is many of his paintings are a little bit more complex and time-consuming. Um, but uh, that is also in interesting to just think about the, that historical trajectory. Because again, Thomas Eakins would, would have been sort of the the historical precedent for someone like Robert Henry of trying to establish some kind of innate American art and to, to create art in America that could be taken seriously because of, at this particular time in American history a lot of artists American artists travel to Europe and they study in Europe and often they stay in Europe and if they do come back to the United States they paint in a very European way uh, and we also see this in Canada the same sort of thing happens with the group of seven who you know, become kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, looking at European art and, and disillusioned by it and thinking, why, why are we painting Canada the way Europeans would paint Canada? We have to make paintings of Canada like Canadians would paint Canada. And Robert Henry would be the same thing. Like, we need to paint America the way Americans would paint America. Uh, having said that, he uh, Robert Henry does travel to Europe a number of times, and including sp attends the Academy Julien, which is uh, or Julien uh, in Paris, which is a you know a very important art school, you know uh, perhaps only rivaled by L'Ecole des Beaux Arts, uh, also in Paris. But the Academy Julien is uh, where a lot of impressionist like painters studied at and originally Robert Henry was was very much inspired by impressionism he uh, because impressionism was the the response the reaction against academic art in Europe and I think that part of Robert Henry you know as a younger artist going to Europe and seeing all of these artists like Monet and Manet and Pissarro who are kind of rebelling against these very traditional uh, approaches to painting, I think he found that very inspiring. So he adopted many of the techniques and approaches to painting that, the, that these Impressionist painters were using. Um, uh, he, he then returns to, he, he starts teaching while he's in Europe and he also returns back to the United States and starts teaching at the Philadelphia School for 
of design for women. And that's kind of interesting because while there are, you know, again, at this time, it's most of these um, arts, art training is quite segregated. You might have uh, academic institutions for male artists, and then often you have a school for female artists that is, you know, teaches women how to paint, but it might also have kind of uh, very domestic crafting classes as well, right? Very promoting quite traditional roles for women um, and just sort of teaching women how to paint to keep women busy, right? So they don't get ideas about working uh, and and possibly having any level of independence, right? In, as in jest, I say, right? Uh, and so he's teaching there. And later on, actually, because of the work that Robert Henry does to help advance the, 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 the opportunities for women in art in the United States, it's actually a, a number of women get together to really help cement his legacy. They're the ones that buy the, the former house of the, that the Kozad family had lived in in Kozad and established it as a museum dedicated to Robert Henry and uh, his uh and as well as not only to robert henry but to uh, the 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 town of koza it's also it's not only the the, the robert henry museum but it's also a, a kind of a history museum for the town of koza which is a town now that i think is just a little over three thousand people so it's a, a small community right um here's just a quick little this is the robert henry museum in koza nebraska if you're ever in that area. Uh, I've never been there myself. Um, let's uh, just see if we can just see any images. I mean, it's obviously very much an art gallery where they have, I think there's 33 sketches and paintings there, mostly sketches, a few paintings that were later donated to the house. So here we see a little bit more of how the house actually looked. Now the house had other tenants after Rob, the, the Kozad family had fled from <laughs> Kozad, uh, including, let me see, there was kind of an interesting, another interesting character, another artist, Miles Marriott, uh, who was a well-known hunting guide, outdoorsman, landscape painter, and uh, who pulled a gun on his best friend and changed his own life. So he actually was involved in, he was a convicted murderer that lived in that house. Uh, so it's, as I was kind of thinking about this, you just wonder, are certain places, do they have a kind of a memory or are they cursed in some way for the Kozad family to move in here and, and for that house to be kind of where uh, this prominent American artist uh, had once lived, and then later on, another artist moved in there, and also gets himself into uh, some trouble. It just seems very uh, odd coincidence, right? Let's return to um, his. Uh... So, as I said. Uh, Robert Henry, after returning from Europe, he moves to Philadelphia. He's teaching at a at the at a school for women to learn how to paint. And while he's in Philadelphia, he sort of forms this circle of artists that become known as the Philadelphia Four, and they start exhibiting together. And a number of these artists become very prominent American artists as they go forward. When Robert Henry moves shortly thereafter to New York City, most of these these other four artists also follow him, right? So, like William Glackens, George Lukes, Everett Shin, and John Sloan. Uh, as I said, I mean, George Lukes, John Sloan, Glackens are all very, very well known. Everett Shin, maybe a little bit less so, but, you know, they gather together they're they're painting talking about each other's paintings probably doing a lot of drinking and smoking of cigars and stuff uh, raucous socializing as they said here and and readings as well sort of a little bit of a book club so you have 
uh, them reading things like uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Walt Whitman, Emile Zola, D D Thoreau, right? So um, it's not just you know, it's, I think that that was very common back in the day, you know, before television and Netflix and stuff, you know, when the sun went down, you couldn't just open up your laptop and watch a movie, you would probably get together with some friends, sit around, have some drinks, talk about a book that you guys are all reading, and it might be just one copy that you're passing around, and everyone takes an opportunity to read it, and then there's a discussion, right? Anyway, as I said, uh, he, uh, around this time, he, he's now got this group of artists that, that uh, are uh, very interested in similar concepts and themes, and this idea of forming a distinctly American art becomes more and more prominent in the minds of those artists, and particularly Robert Henry. And... As I said, he was very interested in Impressionism when he was in Europe and studying in France and Paris. He he was kind of obsessed with Impressionism. And a lot of his early paintings are Impressionist inspired. But when he gets back to the United States, he just starts thinking... Like, one of the features of Impressionist painting is these very pastoral, rural scenes of people with umbrellas and parasols standing in the tall grass and the wind blowing and uh you know they're they're beautiful paintings monet and manet like these picnics in the in the forest or along the shore of the seine river you'd rarely see buildings uh cityscapes there are some you know uh, i can think of a few pissarro paintings in particular that have a lot of um uh, you know, uh, Paris and the flags and everything. But for the most part, they, they go out to the countryside to make those paintings. And when Robert Henry comes back to Philadelphia, he's living in the city. And then later when he moves to New York, you know, these are big industrial towns that are brown and smoggy. And, you know, there are, there are parks inside. But there, it's a much more uh, urban type of environment that he's living in. And when he thinks back to those European paintings of the, the Monet with the you know water lilies and bright colors, I think he thinks like, is this, I, I just, how can, how can I, I can't paint New York City in emerald greens and bright yellows and you know, it's it seems a little bit that would it just you can't translate that to this American environment. So, what one of the things that results is this much more muted palette with a lot more of browns and grays, and I think that's essentially what ends up happening is this particular look of painting becomes dubbed the Ashcan approach or the Ashcan school of painting partly because it sort of looks like you know the a bucket where people are are, are um, um, tapping out their cigars and cigarettes in a bar right the ash can and just like almost every other uh, art movement that was named originally by a critic who was trying to ridicule them that's what happened with impressionism that's what happened with cubism you have ashcan is that same sort of thing like oh the, all of these paintings are all brown and gray they look like ashes in the bottom of an ashcan like ugh, gross and then but these guys kind of look around and be like ashcan i kind of like that it there's a kind of a a gritty, urban, uh, uh, underdog kind of quality to it, right? And so they embrace that term as their own, and and Robert Henry, from that point forward, becomes becomes known as the the kind of founder and leader of the Ashcan school of art that is based in 
in New York and with those artists that he originally uh, met in Philadelphia. And so at, at the Ashcan School was originally sort of a two-city thing until most of those artists moved to New York. Um, so like here, uh, the, the, the great American art critic Robert Hughes, he's American, right? Or is he British? Now that I think about that. Australian. I was thinking his accent is... Yeah. Um, it, by the way, if you're ever interested, Robert Hughes did a great series of uh, called The Power of Art. I remember watching those when I was in art school. Highly, highly, highly recommended uh, videos. I'm, I'm, not, I'm sure they're on YouTube probably at this point. Anyway, uh, Robert Hughes says, Henry wanted art to be akin to journalism. He wanted paint to be as real as mud. The clods of horse shit and snow that froze on Broadway in winter, as real as human product, as real a human product as sweat, carrying the unsuppressed smell of human life. Oh, what a great! Uh, you can see how Robert Hughes, how evocative his language is, but that idea that 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 these paintings could almost you could smell the the sweat and the horse dung in the street just like you would walking down a muddy New York street in the middle of winter right uh, and it also you know they, they talk about as you know that uh, around this time there's that kind of um, a particular type of journalism they call like the mud raking journalism which you know now we see is particularly negative, but around that time was was this type of investigative journalism that was trying to show uh, and bring to light the terrible conditions of people in tenement housing in New York. There's a great museum in New York, the Tenement Museum, that shows how people lived in basically total slums in New York in the late 1800s, early 1900s, or sorry, late teen, late 1800s, early 1900s. Did I just say that? So that is, you know, there's that is a major problem. A lot of disease is spreading in in those areas, and uh, constant source of discussion. Robert Henry politically is also uh, very left wing. He he's basically an anarchist. Uh, so I'm sure that is also a big part of his thinking approach to painting is like really trying to capture the reality of life in New York City and not some kind of um, beautified, idealized life like the Impressionists. So even though he's originally very inspired by the Impressionists, as he uh, spends more time back in the United States, he really starts to have sort of second thoughts and really wanting to kind of find a different, uh, his own unique way of expressing uh, what he sees. Uh, another thing too, he, he while he's uh, in Philadelphia, he meets the Canadian artist James uh, Morris or James Wilson Morris, who I'm there's a I'm going to be doing an episode of his in October I think in October there's there's a is going to be Morris week because there's a there's a bunch of artists that have Morris first name and last names uh, many of them Canadian that we're going to take a look at so. Uh, but one of the things that Morris was famous for was taking these little tiny paintings, like little canvases, just about that big, and having like a, a little cigar-like box full of paint with oil paint, which remember, oil paint can take months to dry. And so if you have a little box just like this with just the basic colors, just like we use here, and a tiny little canvas, what you can do is have it in your coat pocket you can pull it out and you can make a quick little paint sketch on the spot, put it back into your pocket and go on about your day. And that was quite revolutionary, uh, especially at the time, just because of the, the tools, uh, pre-made paint and, and tubes and everything. But it allowed him to kind of, you know, document this, you know, these spontaneous depictions of urban scenes. Um, he gets married to uh, uh, one of his students in one of his art classes, and they, uh, um, it seems like they had a happy relationship, although she died shortly thereafter. I think they only were married for about 
seven or eight years before she dies and then he later remarries this is a portrait he makes of his second wife here uh, Marjorie Oregon who was uh, her, an artist her, herself uh, and she she usually painted under her own name uh, as opposed to Marjorie Henry but this is one of the most famous paintings that he did and you know maybe one day we'll do do that that painting um, what else do I want to say? Also, around this time, he, he rebels against the National Academy of Design, which is, you know, like an academy like they had in Europe, right? So all of these academies, which we've talked about many times uh, before, uh, he is now kind of in that butting heads against that group. And having spent time in, in Paris and seen the Impressionists and becoming quite familiar with with how they started their own Salon des Indépendants, the independent salon to rival the Academy. And basically because the Academies were so powerful that they could pick and choose who the artists of the day were, the Impressionists like Monet and Manet were like, screw this, you don't want to show our paintings? We're going to have our own exhibition. So this is another evolution in the step of Robert Henry, where he, you know, he refers to the Academy as a cemetery of art. You know, that's where artists go to die, where all great creativity is extinguished, right? <laughs> and so that's one of the things. So the, this group of artists, they form their own exhibition and they call themselves The Eight. And um, they are uh, really trying to forge this new, very distinct American uh, style here. Also towards the, you know, the, this right before World War One, a very, very famous exhibition uh, happens in New York City called the Armory Show. And this is really probably the most single most important art exhibition in the history of North America by far, because uh, and I'm sure we've talked about this at, at various different times. Um, but the Armory Show was this huge exhibition that was really the very first time that artwork by Picasso, Matisse, Cezanne, and, and a lot of the, the, the more avant-garde painters from Europe, that was the first time most of it had ever been exhibited in the United States. And so it was really the first time where the American public saw things like cubism, fauvism, futurism, all of these isms uh, that were totally groundbreaking and new uh, that's when they hit the, the 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 coast of of north america and it was like a bomb going off everyone was shocked i think one of the things people forget is not only was the armory show did it have all of this european art but it also had half of the exhibition was dedicated to american artists so you, you have a bunch of, of these members of what later becomes the Ashcan School or the Eight uh, who are exhibiting in their own rooms. That Those artworks, you know, I, um, I think one of the reasons why they're kind of forgot is they were still a little bit more traditional. A lot of these artists had never heard, or they probably heard of Picasso, but they really probably hadn't seen much of his work except maybe reproduced in grainy images and black and white in newspapers. So it's really the first time they see what's happening. And I think probably their work looked a little bit conservative and out of date compared to what they saw in the European galleries. But, uh, um, and there is, when it comes to Robert Henry, I think unfairly that he's been criticized as being anti-avant-garde, that he, because he thought of himself and his group of artists as being on the leading edge of American art. And they participate in the Armory Show, and then they walk in and they see these Cubist paintings, and, you know, like, this this painting we did just the other day is from 1940, but you can imagine if you were an artist and, you know, you see your paintings look like this, and in the gallery right next to you, you see paintings that are similar to this, a Cubist painting. All of a sudden, your work looks pretty 
you know, uh, mild in comparison, right? So I think um, Robert Henry was a little bit taken aback and shocked. There's some descriptions saying that he was very negative about that work. And there's also descriptions of him saying that he he's expressly told his students, you've got to go check that exhibition out. You've got to check out what they're doing in Europe right now. Which I think is shows his... If I and mean, again, it's hard to say who who is right, but um, if that is the case, it does show him as a teacher, even though he's he's he never paints in those styles, that he encourages his students to at least be aware of what's going on elsewhere in the world at the same time, so that they are at least able to have some a response or contend with that work. So, um, what else? Uh, as I said, Robert Henry politically was probably very left-wing, like an anarchist. He became friends with Emma Goldman, who's probably the most famous American anarchist. Um, he he then goes, he starts doing a lot of traveling. He spends time in Ireland and Santa Fe. He moves to Santa Fe. He encourages other artists to move to Santa Fe. Uh, and... Um, which that's also a whole other thing. The, the the artists that moved to the American Southwest around this time, you have people like uh, Ansel Adams, the photographer, Giorgio O'Keefe. So there's um, uh, uh, a, a, a I think you, especially because you have these American artists in New York City, this big industrial town, that they start thinking, okay, the uh, New York big industrial town kind of looks a little bit like Berlin or Paris or London what does the American landscape look like what is what if we're trying to find something that's distinctly American painting buildings that look like buildings that could be anywhere I don't know well, maybe we got to find a landscape that you cannot find in in England or France and San, you know in New Mexico you're, you've got the Grand Canyon not too far away, so that is something that is very, very unique. And if you haven't been to the Grand Canyon, you've got to go to the Grand Canyon. It is, that's mind-blowing. It is an incredible landscape. The scale of it is incomprehensible. I'll just to tell you a story real quick. I remember going to the Grand Canyon and looking at the landscape, and then like a tour bus pulled up, and they were just get, got off, and they're talking and just sort of listening in, and this guy is saying you see that river down there that river at this wide area is the width of two football fields wide and you're looking and you're like no no I could probably throw a rock across that that's like I could wade across it's not that that big or deep and then you see like a little tiny kayak and you're like oh my goodness it, it's just so big that the, that the human brain is incapable of perceiving the scale scale that you're seeing um okay i want to get to the painting real quick what else do i want to mention um uh so he as i said he died kind of quite suddenly in a surprise to his friends of prostate cancer and um he had he'd been suffering for a while but he didn't tell anybody so again it was that was quite a surprise and um the other last little thing that I think is interesting here is uh, um, one of the things that he was really interested in, and I would say probably earlier on in his in his life, he was really interested in this concept of dynamic symmetry. And dynamic symmetry is uh, was a kind of concept that is uh, basically this 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 artist Jay Hambidge. He came up with this, with the concept of dynamic symmetry, and it's kind of loosely based on the like the idea of the rule of three and the uh, golden ratio, and you have these this idea of like the perfect composition can be arrived at through mathematical means. That there is literally a formula that one can follow to create the perfect painting. Uh, this, these ideas of rule of, of thirds and the golden ratio go back 
the thousands of years uh, and are and are based on mathematics and uh, 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 close observation of nature as well as like people believe them to be divinely inspired at least the, the golden ratio but you know you could see like one of the things that they became fascinated by is the Fibonacci sequence and how everything can be kind of constantly divided and uh, these numbers will continue to repeat endlessly no matter how close or far away you zoom in or out of things and those I think a lot of artists including myself we become pretty interested in the uh, in in searching for that one key, the universal approach to painting that can solve problems and help other people to become artists as well, right? That's kind of what I'm doing here, right? And um, it uh, the at the more and more you do the more tempting it is to form a uh, a single unified theory to help explain your approach to painting and why other paintings look great in fact i think it's worth just mentioning here that this is one of the most important required readings for any artist is this book by Robert Henry, The Art Spirit. Now, it was, it was not actually written by... All of the content is is written by him, but essentially it's his lectures that have been compiled together into book form by one of his former students. But you'll often hear a lot of people to this day saying that The Art Spirit is really one of the most important required uh, readings for any young artist or old artist as well right in fact you know here's a clip of Walt Disney you know the inventor of Mickey Mouse etc reading from and talking about the importance of Robert Henry and this specific book the art spirit and the influence it had on Walt Disney and why Walt Disney gave this book to every one of his employees and made them read it because he, he believed that what Robert Henry was talking about uh, because this book is not really it's not an instruction manual for painting although there is um, some uh, some discussion of that mostly it's just about like a philosophical approach to being an artist what the artist's role in society is how they should conduct themselves the the unique way that an artist can observe and, and appreciate the world. Um, here's a couple of other great... Uh, so, so this here is uh, kind of um, based on the, the, the art spirit. There's a number of, of YouTube videos which you can watch that basically read that book for you. Um, uh, and so let's just... We're going to move on to the painting itself real quick here. This is the artwork that we're going to be painting here, Mildred Clark von Kleinbusch from 1914. And it's in the collection of the Princeton University Art Museum. This painting was um, uh, commissioned by this couple, uh, Carl and Mildred von Kleinsberg, who saw one of the exhibitions of, of Robert Henry, loved his work, looked him up in the phone book. Remember when those things existed? Tracked him down and commissioned him to do this painting. And then later on, when Carl, the, the husband, uh, became quite wealthy, he donated this, not only this painting, but quite a lot of money to Princeton University. And so this is sort of one of their, their key artworks on display. And here's another uh, artwork uh, of... The same subject that uh, on this uh, that was by a different artist as well. So you could see they were very active in in supporting the local art community. Okay, so I think it's time to get going here. So typically, what um, an artist might do if we just sort of talk about like the artistic process here is probably the way that 
an artist like Robert Henry would work is potentially maybe doing a little like so let's say we have a blank canvas right potentially what he might do is do a little bit of sketching he might uh, probably already had like a sketchbook where he might have drawn uh, this woman or any other subject and I should also mention that one of the the things that Robert Henry is most famous for is painting children painting commissioned paintings of children for for wealthy people um, I was thinking about doing one of those but it's they're a little bit more complex uh, anyway um, so what he probably done is took a sketch and then he may have either done that just transferred the sketch onto a canvas or he might have just drawn it again with the, the person in front of him or just from the sketch so he might have had the sketch he might have drawn someone like this woman had the sketch and then had her come back the next day and then looking at his sketch and her again sitting there would draw that on maybe very very loosely and maybe even potentially using like a protractor or something to kind of get the proportions as correct as he wanted and then he would probably stain it and then combine the stain with the uh, the, the underpainting that we're about to do so we're not doing exactly what what he's done but maybe we can replicate it a little bit here so let's get some paint onto our palette again uh, you can just rewind a little back, bit back here to look at the imprimatura um, uh, at the very beginning of that chapter I just outlined what these colors are the names and all the different options if you don't want to use this particular brand um, you know I, I basically put about as much paint as I put toothpaste on my toothbrush here. I've got black, but I'm just gonna leave the black in my box because I don't think we're gonna need it. We can make our own black. I think we can squeeze a little bit more out here. This is the tube ringer. I love this tool. It's like one of my favorite things on earth. Squeeze out the remaining paint here. There's still more in there too. We'll cut that open at some point. I think we're going to use most of the paint, the different colors here. I do notice that recently I've been using less and less cool red, but I'll still put it on the palette because it's nice to have that available. So let's mix a color that would be similar to what Robert Henry would have used at this stage. Because if we look at the painting here, we see in the background, we've got some cool browns with this cool green over top of it. We also have that kind of a brown underneath uh, the, the, the painting here. So let's mix a bit of a, uh, let's mix a cool let's mix a cool brown because we're going to use that for the background and we can use that for our underpainting as well so let's make a bigger batch of it here i was going to make a small batch of course the computer needs a reboot come on this again
Okay, here we are. Here it is. That's weird. weird. It's just kind of bugged, bugged out. out. Okay. okay. There, we there we go. go. Okay. okay. So, so um, let's, let's mix, mix a cool brown. brown. We'll, we'll start, start with uh, let's see our cool, cool yellow. yellow. We'll, take we'll take our, our cool, cool reds, reds here. here. Here's, Here's our, our cool red, red in action. action. So, so it's, it's mostly cool yellow, yellow a little, little bit of cool red. red. And then and I'll, I'll take, take some, some cool, cool blue. blue. Less, Less of that, that right? right? And then and we're going to get this cool brown. brown. It's, always it's always advisable, advisable to, start to start with maybe a maybe more, more yellow dominant color. color and then and just, just add red and, red and blue, blue to it as you go, go to get closer, closer to the color you want. want. Just a little bit more blue in there. It just makes it a little bit darker. As you, As you put, put more, more blue, blue in there, there it's going to go, go kind of green. green. So, so I just, just sort of add a little, little bit, bit more, more red to balance, balance that out. out. If you if put, you put about, about equal proportions of these, of these three, three cool colors, colors together, together, you're going to get a gray. gray. So, so just be careful. careful. If, you're, if, if it gets gray, just add, add more yellow and red to it, and then it'll kind of bring back some of the orange quality. Okay. okay, so, so I'm just, just going to take, take this. this. Okay. So, so what I'm going to do, do here, here it's just, it's just a, a little, little bit of outline, outline. and, and as, as I said, the way, way that Robert Henry probably did this is he might have, have had a very basic sketch on here, or he, or he may have just immediately started to attack it with this brown and just, just sort of outlining where, where some of the most important features were. So, so this, this type, type of approach here is, here is just, just to kind of establish the proportions of the face and, 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 um, and also so that, so that if we get a lot of paint on her, on her face later on, on, we'll be easily able to find where her features, features are. Sometimes, sometimes they can get a little bit lost, lost right? right?
Oh, excuse, excuse me. me. Oh, oh my goodness. goodness. Where did that come from? So we'll, we'll be, be done, done here in a second. second. Really, really, we don't, we don't need, need to do this, this in soft, soft, you know, in, in fact, fact, in recent, recent paintings, paintings, I haven't done much of this at all. At all. But, but I did, I did want, want to kind of just give you a quick, quick sense of how he would, would have worked. worked. That this, this would have been probably a stage, stage of the painting like this. A very quick little sketch with underpainting. With or without the pencil lines having been there originally. I'm not exactly sure. Okay. okay. So, so I got that done. done. Just, wipe Just wipe off, off that excess paint, paint, clean, clean my, my paintbrush. paintbrush. And we'll move to the, the next step. step. Okay. okay, so, so now, now we've got, got the underdrawing, our imprimatura, and the underpainting established, established, right? And, and it's not, not exactly the way that, way that you would have done it, but I think in the spirit of, of, of his approach. So now, so now let's work, work on the background. background. Let's, let's establish that, that, and there's a few colors that we want to put in the background. background. Primarily to start, what we want is a brown. Because we can see, see that there's this brown, and even a little, little bit of lighter, lighter yellowy areas of that brown, which tells me, me not necessarily that he painted a yellow like, like we've done, done but probably that he worked the surface uh, with probably a few times with the brown that we just mixed. So let's paint that on here. Let's even put them side by side again so that we can see a little bit of this process. We're going to put this cold brown, brown on here, here. Right? right this, this is, is a brown we made using cold red, red cold blue and cold, cold yellow and, and just begin, again you want to be just, just take your time mixing that because if you uh, mix, mix it really, really quickly and you have equal proportions, proportions of these colors, colors you'll get a gray so, so to get, to get that, that brown, brown just make sure you got maybe a little, little bit more yellow, yellow red in there. Very, very little blue. blue. The, the more, more blue, blue you put in there, the more, more quickly, quickly this is going, going to go gray. gray. I'm also kind of, you know, I'm not, I don't want an even coat of this paint. Almost, you know, I'm, you know, I'm deliberately kind of painting it with a bit of a, bit of a smaller brush. Because if you get the larger the brush you have, the more even of a coat of paint you have. And I don't really want an even coat of paint. In this type of approach to painting, we want something that's a little bit more gestural. I'm also going to take this same color and I'm going to go into her hair. hair. Actually, Actually, you know, know what? what? I notice he's taking, taking a bit more of this red, red and mixing, mixing it into here. here. Give her a bit more of a reddish quality to, the, to, to her hair. hair. Very, Very subtle, subtle, but it's there. there. And then he's also, also taking, taking a bit more yellow into this, this color, color and painting, painting that yellow up here. here. Add a bit, a bit more of this cool, cool yellow, yellow to that, that part, part of her hair. hair. I, would I would also take, take maybe a bit, a bit of this yellow. yellow. You know what? I think, I think that's, that's good. good. I 
I think that's good. good. I could have maybe even have painted, painted a bit more, more red. red. In here. Add a bit, bit more red. red. This is cool red, red into, into this, this mixture. mixture. Okay. okay. So, so now, now we've, we've got, got that, that kind of, kind of background, background step step started. started. So what, so what I'm going to do, do now, now is I'm going to blow dry, dry that, that background, background and then we're going to mix some, some cool uh, green to go over top, top of it. it. So I'll we'll blow dry this. this. Okay. Hopefully the audio is okay now. So now we want to get some of this green in here. And so let's take... I almost feel like I, this could have been darker. In fact, you know what? Let's take... Let's mix this again. I'm going to need a bit more cool red. Yellow. Maybe a bit more blue. Now I'm going to go over the background again. really darkening this side here. And it's interesting, what he's doing here is he's deliberately making this side darker because this side is also the lighter side of her face. So that's, we're gonna get more contrast here with a dark background here, lighter side of the face darker side of the face over here therefore lighter background right so he's deliberately darkening certain so that we have more contrast here we have dark light light dark okay so that's good but let's now i'm going to blow dry that again and then we'll put our green over top
Okay. So the next step, let's get some more cool yellow on here. The next step we're going to do is I'm not, without washing my brush, I'm going to keep the same brown on here. And I mix my cool yellow and cool blue together. We get this very electric color. Right? But it's still a little bit muted. It's not as intense as it would be if I because I've got this bit of a brown on my brush already, right? And that's just going to kind of take some of the intensity of that color off. And let's kind of paint with this green. Scrubbing it in almost kind of like a dry brush, right? So there's just barely any paint on here. Let's mix that again. Take some of our brown back in there. take a bit more blue and yellow and this time using less and less of the the brown even darker so let's take a bit more warm red cool blue so you see how that kind of goes into a bit of a gray I'll take that just use this to darken Maybe that's almost a bit too much down here. So it's going to take a rag and try to wipe a bit of that back. Okay, I think that's pretty good. Just wipe that brush off and then we'll clean it. You can see I just use a really dark color because I wipe most of that paint off. My water just stays, doesn't go black, right? It stays kind of dirty. I wouldn't want to drink out of it, but it's not, uh, I don't need to get any new water. Okay, I think that's, let's actually do, give it a quick blow dry.
Okay. So now that we've got our background, I think finished, but we may want to lighten it or darken it, just depending on how the rest of the painting goes. Let's now focus on the the subject of today's painting in in the center of, of the artwork here. So we're going to move on to foreground pass here, number one. And maybe it's also just let's just take a second and look at how we want to approach this. I think what I'll do is probably work on You know what? I, okay, so there's a few things. I, my, my instinct is to work on her face a little bit right away. The one thing is, is we still have a lot of because usually what I like to do is I like to start with thing at the furthest in behind, and then work my way up top. Um, and I do like that. That that works usually really well. But we got her clothing is so dark that I feel like it's very hard to see what color her skin should be when I still have all of this bright yellow here. So I think what I'm going to do to start is I'm, I'm going to, we've got her hair. I'm going to do her clothing first and then we'll do her skin and then we'll probably finish with the clothing on top. So uh, what we want is a bit of a brown or a kind of brownish purpley color. And we're going to use warmer colors now because we used all these cool colors for our background. We want to use warmer colors for the foreground. So that purple that we see, like if we mix our cool red and our warm blue together, we're going to get a beautiful, super saturated purple, right? We want instead a bit more of a muted purple. So I'm instead going to take my warm red and my cool blue, and we're going to get a purple, but it's going to be less intense, right? It's closer to the neutral core. It gives it a bit more of a dirty purple, not, not as luminous as we would if we used our warm red. The one thing is, if we paint this directly onto that yellow, it does make me a little bit worried that it's going to look a little bit brownish. So I might overemphasize the amount of blue in this mixture. And I'm going to add just a tad bit of white in here. That's, that's going to kind of give it just that little bit of punch needed to overcome some of that yellow. And then let's paint that in here. You know what, this could be, I'm going to go like this because I think this might have been stuff I added when I was doing the Photoshop here. Oops. That's not there at all. Even take my rag, perhaps. So you can see how that little bit of yellow underneath gives it a bit more of a brownish quality, which isn't in and of itself bad. 
but um, we'll come back over top shortly afterwards and do a little bit more work in here. dry brush okay and I just wiped my brush off but not completely clean because I'm going to take some of this white and you see I got a little bit of purple on that white all this down here. I think this would, would have been like her blouse or something. So go so now this is going to really help us more accurately judge the colors that we want to mix for her her skin tone here um, because now we don't have all of that yellow in her clothing and her collar to kind of overcome and contend with actually you know what? I think I'm gonna add I'm gonna take now that I'm looking at it, some of this white, paint that into some of the flowers lightly like that. Okay. Do I need to blow dry that? I think we'll be okay. So let's look at her face now, her skin tone. And that skin tone here to, to paint this, uh, we, what we're gonna start with is a, is a flesh tone. We're gonna mix one that's peachy, but it's gonna be have a little bit more of a yellowish quality to it. And then as we go, we're gonna build up a little bit more red in there, okay? so. Our underlying value that we want to mix is this one we sort of see right kind of between the eyes here so let's take our warm uh, uh, yellow oops take our warm yellow a bit of warm red mix this in there like just a little bit of, of red right that looks pretty good. We always want to take just a little bit of blue. Like you could see barely any, right? Just put a little bit of that in there. Maybe just a bit more. A little bit more red. So now we have just a little bit of a brownish kind of color. Now let's take our white mix that here and we're pretty close so let's make a bigger batch of it here
Okay. Um, so I'm going to take that color. Now there's a lot of white in here, so if I just paint this right over top without having those lines underneath, it could make it kind of tricky to f to see where the facial features are. They're going to disappear underneath this color a little bit. And I'm not afraid to paint over top of my my pencil lines a little bit because I'm gonna I can then go back over top and clean that up later. Now, oops. Now I did the original painting is was much more square, so I added some stuff at the bottom. I think I'm gonna do a little bit, just hint that this is her hand down here, maybe. Do I wanna do that? Maybe a little bit of that, I think. Do I want her blouse going on? Oh, it looks like her Okay, yeah, I was thinking maybe do I want to do a little bit of this down here where her belly button is, but it looks like her collar is going to come in closer here, so. Uh, oops. So as we start, I think now it's time to retire this brush that we've been using. It's about the size of my thumbnail, right? And we're going to start going down to smaller and smaller brushes, right? So at this point, the painting has been, I think, well established. And now we're going to start going into some details. So let's, uh, let's just make mention of this. So, uh, as, a, as I was saying, we, I think we're, we're, we're done with the, the bigger brush. Now, from now on, we're going to go into smaller brushes to, to finish this painting off. And... Kind of a lump of paint there. Let's just get rid of that so it doesn't um, affect the rest of the painting. Okay. So, let's start mixing. What, what we'll do is, I think let's go for a bit of a darker color next. One, This is an interesting painting because this painting, we've actually got quite a lot of, it, it's a very even color or even lighting. Most of the time, like if we're doing a portrait of someone, what we'd want to do is have stronger contrast. We'd have one side that is maybe more dramatically uh, lit. So maybe much darker. We have hi highlight, shadow. In this painting, the whole face is quite well lit. And he's also, I think this is, a, he's, he's trying to show us in this painting how good of a painter he is. He's kind of boasting here. Because usually what people do if someone is facing in in let's say that direction as she is we usually would want to have this the the this left or i guess her right side of the painting illuminated and this being the darker side so he's like to have this where you know the nose is very subtly 
uh, lit here between the difference between the nose, bridge of the nose here, and her cheek and, and underneath her eye. That is tricky to do, and uh, he's, I'm sure he's doing that to kind of show us his uh, the subtle use of color here because it, it's this painting is deceptively difficult at this stage when we start getting into um, why he posed her in this way, why he lit her in this way. This is the kind of thing other artists would be like, whoa, that's uh, that's really nice. Most others would be like, oh, it looks great. It looks like a good painting. Other artists are like, whoa, I see what you did there. That's pretty powerful, pretty cool. Anyway, uh, what color should we... Let's mix... Let's go for these kind of... We'll use the same color, but we're going to introduce more of a green, almost a gray in here. Um... In fact, he's, he's not really, he's not, there's no black in this painting, nor are there really any grays in this painting. Um, he's just using actually quite a strong color palette to do this. Okay, so um, let's take, this will be our flesh tone here, obviously. I think I'm going to take a little bit of cool blue and mix that in here here and cool and warm red and and uh, cool yellow get a bit of a darker black very muted color but I'm now gonna mix this over here so you see that? This color is kind of like a, it's about a, it's kind of like our flesh tone, but it's a bit of a grayish quality. I mean, because basically I, I mixed a black, right? Or cool blue, cool yellow, and warm red make a black. I didn't let it go super black because I don't want it to be black black, but this is, I think, our, a really good um, color for our more muted areas of the painting. And now I'm going to take some... Oops, glazing fluid here and let's mix this up that glazing fluid is going to give us a little bit of wiggle room as we paint here um, okay in fact I'm going to wipe oh come on in fact I'm going to wipe off the excess paint here so that we get, I don't have all of that paint, we just have more of the glaze, the thinner version of this paint. And... Another brush that's clean and dry and just sort of blend that out a little bit
Okay, so that's where my blending brush got a little bit uh, dirty. here So I'm going to go up into the hairline just a little bit. Okay. Wow, that's cool. It probably doesn't look... Colors aren't super accurate on camera, but um, I think that's where we're, we're in the zone. So I'm going to blow dry this and then I'm going to do just a, a little bit more. Okay, so let's continue. I'm just gonna go uh, take this, maybe a bit more color in here, just a little bit darker. Oops, sorry. It's been taking that, bringing it in here to make it a bit darker.
does a great job of getting these kind of uh, reflections on the other side like a, this reflected light on the inside of her uh, her neck there that's brilliant I might have, I was a little bit heavy with her jaw there, but that's, I think, okay. Let me get a bit more closer to her eye. Let's now mix um, a bit more of a reddish quality here, reddish brown. We'll take some of this brown that we made earlier, give it more red, a bit more blue. So you have a very reddish brown now. Now we're going to use this to do some outlining. Uh, in fact, I should, let me just blow dry this before I... what maybe before I put this red in I'm gonna mix the green of her eyes so I'm gonna take my warm blue and my cool yellow it's bright green eyes
And the, th the thing with doing eyes is trying to get them to look in the right place. So I always start from the center and then work my way out and then I look at them and, and thinking even like how much white is on either side here of these eyes. So you can see I'm moving this eye, widening it in that direction so it gets, so it's kind of lining up with that one. Now that eye looks kind of big. So I'll make sure it's equally big over here. Good. I'm also just going to take a little bit of white without cleaning my brush. In fact, I don't mind if I get a little bit of green. Oops. Taking a little bit of white, allowing just maybe a little bit of that green to get on there. little bit uh, too white. It's okay. I'm just taking this green. It's going to paint. Oops, sorry, I just took my uh, my warm red and my my warm blue and a little bit of warm yellow, but mostly warm red to give that really nice brown. And now let's do a little bit of outlining here.
Bus, ne? Let's paint her lips here. So the top lip is always the darker lip because it's getting some shade, right? Oops. getting kind of big she's got a little bit of Botox I think So this is a very dry brush now. Okay, I'm gonna take a bit more red in here. And just go back over these lips. I'm also going to take a bit of glazing fluid there. giving a little bit more color into those eyebrows so they're not just green eyebrows oops
Getting good. So let's now take, uh, let's, we're going to add white to this red. And we're also going to add some glazing fluid to it so that we can get a really nice thin application of this paint here. Now I want to blow dry this so I don't smudge. Once we start looking at this, you're going to see this kind of pink color all over her face. I need more glazing fluid here. Just look at her chest here. There's a bit more purpley qualities down here, but let's, we'll paint a bit of uh, this into the shadow.
So what happens when you just overwork an area here. Let's get some water on here. Let's see if we can just wipe a bunch of that away. So we'll start that again. We'll blow dry that and then we'll, we'll do that again. So just giving a little bit of, uh, of warmth and redness under her neck there, I think is really helpful. It's coming along. I'm not sure how well it's translating on camera, but it's looking great from my side of the of the computer. Okay, let's blow dry that.
So I'm just, I keep on adding a little bit more uh, red here. That's a lot. Oops. Just gonna try to get a bit more of an angle slope there. There we go. Okay, let's blow dry that.
so it's muted that whole time. Uh, it looks like we'll, we will mix just a little bit of black. So we'll take our cool blue, cool yellow, and cool red. Oops, I need, or sorry, warm red. Mix that together. A little purpley, so we add a bit more uh, yellow to it, and then we get a black. Maybe a little bit more on the blue side, but that kind of seems to make sense with Robert Henry. Um, I just need to expand her, I guess, her left pupil slightly. Or um, iris, I mean. So now what I want to do is some highlights and get a little bit of white back onto her face because we've we've gone dark. We need to get light again. So let's just blow dry this. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the original um, color we mixed. Looks like i got to make more of it. Just adding more white into this mix. So this is the original flesh tone we made, right? And we're just adding some glazing fluid in here. We'll just amp up the contrast just a little bit. So let's look at, at where the highlights are. We've got one right on the tip of the nose here. Just soften those edges a bit. Got another one right there. Got some underneath. Her eyebrow. Got 
it's um, right here on her forehead. Right, we're, we're going to have to go over some of these areas a few times. It's uh, we're just you know, just like we did with the dark, going over some of those areas a few times. So let's blow dry that and we'll come back again. Then we'll just go right onto her hair.
Jesus. Okay, and then I'm just going to take a little bit of this white, or the same color, and get a bit of better point. There we go. Ah. I think that's probably good enough. Let's let's move on. We could just be sitting here for a while because we also don't know what the, or it's going to look entirely like until her hair is done, right? Okay, let's take a quick little second here and look at. So you can see in her hair, there's actually a, kind of this same kind of uh, purpley brownish color that we painted down here. Uh, let's get, let's, let's paint maybe up here and then we'll add more red to it. So actually, let's stay with a smaller brush. Let's mix. Let's take our warm, warm red, warm blue, and warm yellow. Let's mix that up here. And use a bit of this. Get 
add a bit of white to it. It looks like I'm going to have to do a little bit of cleaning up, darkening in that background just a little bit as after a bit here. So right now her th neck looks quite wide. So now that I'm coming in and, and refining, it didn't look bad before because it just looked kind of unfinished. But now I kind of have to just uh, get a little more precise. I'm going to take the same color we used for her hair or her skin tone a little bit earlier on. Mix a bit of this white into it. And then we'll progressively get uh, darker, taking my brown that's got a little bit of that blue in there.
just trying to preserve some of the kind of the shape of her hair here. Okay, and then as I go, I'm getting more and more blue into my my red here. Right, we're just darkening this color ever so slightly. You're starting to come some of that purpley dark brown as I'm mixing into my more and more into my blue here. All right, so we got our warm blue, warm red using less and less yellow it's becoming more and more purpley As we get right down into her, next to her neck here behind the collar, it gets much darker, obviously.
I don't want to go too dark here because ideally this area is is a little bit darker than this. So I may even go, I'm going to do a little bit more in the background anyway. But that's just something I want to keep in mind. Okay, so I think I'm going to do a lot of the rest with a kind of a light glaze. I think now let's we're let's do uh, what should we do next? Maybe let's do her collar. I'm gonna go back. Well, should I? Let's go to a sm even smaller brush. Okay. So we'll use this. Um, this white. A bit of the same color we've just been using here.
make it into a bit more of let's make a gray or actually shoot, we have a gray right there okay <laughs> like I gotta make a gray oh there's a gray I've already done that oops paintbrush broke let's put a bit of glazing fluid on there I'll continue darkening the rest of that with glaze. I'll take this white, maybe even with a bit of warm yellow. Let's now do her clothing again. Uh, let's take the small, well, not too small of a brush. Let's take our warm blue and cool red. This is a very dark color. It's got that bit of a purpley quality to it.
take a bit of glazing fluid and put that in my mixture. Just so I can get a little bit more transparency as I do some of these areas in here. Make a bit of a darker version of that again. A bit more opaque. Hmm, it's getting a little bit more plum. Color. Let's get a bit more. Oh, just put way too much blue on my palette there. <laughs> Squeezed it out. Came out really a little too much, but that's okay. Just gonna wipe off that excess. Let's just take some of this blue right out of the tube. Warm blue. And Bit of white. Actually, there's even a bit of cool blue in there, yeah.
So now let's do some flowers. Let's take this cool yellow. Just launch it right in here. Let's take some warm yellow and a little bit of warm, actually mostly warm yellow. I'm gonna make these flowers bigger actually down here to occupy more of the space. Take some white and, oops, it's a little bit too more white than I was expecting, but that's okay. So let's just embrace that and do that brown that's supposed to be there anyway. some red right out of the tube. Mix an orange with it.
get that green in. So that green, I think it's a little bit more cool. Just a little bit intense. Let's take a bit of white, mix that in there, maybe just a bit more yellow. Now I gotta figure out what I want to do at the bottom of this painting because I've got this extra room here. Do I want to? Give a little bit of impression of a hand here. What if we take a bit of a little bit of a peachier color? So I'm, right now, I'm not even exactly sure what color I want to use. So I'm just sort of mixing a bit. A bit more of a blush.
this bit of white in there I don't like. Okay, but um, let's. Um, I'm gonna glaze a little bit her hair, darken that down. So let's let's take some of this blue and red, even a little bit of yellow. I just want to take, oops. Take this and go into her ha hair just a little bit. Okay, so now I'm just gonna go back to my brown, my cool brown that I made at the very beginning. So taking my cool yellow, cool blue, and cool red. Just take a bit more, take a little bit of warm red in there. has made that kind of a little bit too grassy green for me. I was trying to get away with not having to add more warm red to the palette. In fact, let's uh, just take a second here to... Okay. So we're just about done. Final few little touches. I just want to do a little bit more in the background because which is a little area on top of her hair that needs to be done. But other than that, we are almost done here. So uh, 
where was it? Take my cool yellow, cool blue, mix that together, get a bit of our cool red together, and we get that brown. Pretty dark brown. Let's. Ooh, that might be too much. Uh, let's go more on the bluish side here. Blue green. Too too vivid. I must have some white in. Oh, I do have a little bit of white in there. Hmm. Is that green down there too intense? I wonder if that's just too Christmas tree like down there. So if we feel that's the case, which I think I do, let's just take a little bit of uh, our glaze. Lightly put a bit of that over top. Okay, love. Okay, love. Have a fun party. Okay, I think that's just about done. I could darken a little bit more on her neck. We want to do that is the question. A little bit of this purple. I 
Actually, let's blow dry that in case there's anything wet there. I do wonder if maybe it's more appropriate for a green to be there than a purple. Let's, ah. Okay, so when that happens and you drop... <laughs> it's a good thing that I blow dried just right before this happened. Um, I'll just wipe that away. Ah. kind of things happen as long as you know if you're regularly blow drying it the paint is going to get you can wipe that stuff away so i think i'm going to actually do a bit more of a green here let's just get rid of that let's go for a warm green let's take our warm blue Glazing fluid. That's good. I want to do just a little bit more here, but I want to blow dry it first.
So, I think that's good enough. I don't think it's going to get much better. <laughs> so, let's wrap it up. Actually, I do think that that blue, this warm blue needs to pop a little bit more. I put a bit of white there and I'm just gonna go back over with my warm blue I'll show up much better there and maybe her hair, we give her just a bit more of a golden kind of crown. close to the original. Okay, that's that feels pretty good. Okay, so let's go to 
It's time to do our side-by-side -side comparison. Just take a look at how these two paintings fared side-by-side -side and see how well we did. Just a reminder to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, take a photograph of your version of today's painting or anything else you're working on. Join the Facebook group. Upload your work to the Facebook group so we can celebrate and share in your achievement. And once a month, I give people advice on how to improve their artwork. And if that's something you want to, to participate in, it's totally free. If you want to support the channel, however, with as little as a dollar donation, consider using the PayPal link below. You can contact me through the Facebook group or my email. All those links are in the description below. So let's look at these two side by side. And I think it's going to turn out pretty good. Um, yeah, I mean, I could even darken the background a little bit more. I don't mind it like it is right now there. You know, some of these brush strokes, that kind of looks pretty wild and intense just on their own. I'm just going to keep it like that. I mean, I, I feel like I, maybe I could darken it around there. Maybe. Uh, maybe let's just do a little bit of that. Let's just darken a little bit. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so there's our finished version of the painting. Let's just zoom in and look at these side by side. Actually, maybe let's go, maybe not quite so close. Um, you know, now I look at it, it, it does look, I, th I think it's a little bit more yellow on camera than it actually is in person. So that might give it that little bit of a slightly sickly quality that I don't think is in the original. Um, obviously you could see maybe a little bit more detail in her hair. I could just keep on glazing and darkening and darkening and darkening that down. Um... In fact, maybe I should just do just a little bit of that. I think that's good. Um, okay. I like the, the kind of spontaneous, the appearance of spontaneity with those brush strokes. I think that looks pretty good. Um, let's just maybe look at the flower. So just as a reminder, 
you know, the paint, I added a bunch of stuff down here on the bottom. I think the original was cropped off down here. So I had a little bit more room. I just sort of quickly sketched in, like, a hand that's holding this bouquet. Uh, I didn't spend much time there at all because not only uh, did it not exist there, but I think towards the bottom of this painting, he's becoming just a little bit more spontaneous as he goes. Uh, we could just take a look maybe at the background as well, just really quickly. You know, I think we nailed the colors pretty close. I could, again, darken that a little bit more. Um, yeah, so we zoom back out. Um, there we go. Okay, everyone, thanks for joining us for painting along. I can't wait to see what you've created. We will see you guys in a couple of days. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon, wherever you are on our beautiful planet Earth. Have a great night and happy painting. You're making the world a better place as you paint, right? Imagine if everyone was painting. Goodness.